금요일 어, 토요일 양일에 붙여서 생태문명, 생태적 어, 경제 시스템, 생태계 과학기술의 지향적 생태문화, 그리고 한반도의 평화와 생태적 미래에 대해서 생각을 나눠보았습니다. 오늘은 우리가 나눠던 생각을 실천하기 위해서 동아시아의 새로운 리더십과 전 세계적인 연계에 대해서 이야기를 나누는 종합토론 세션을 하고 그리고 잠시 휴식한 후 11시부터는 종합토론 세션을 하겠습니다. 그리고 점심 식사가 있고요. 1시부터는 시청하신 분들께서는 DMZ 생태 투어를 시작하시면 되겠습니다. 그러면 첫 번째 세션, 아, 아니 죄송합니다. 마지막 아, 종합토론 세션으로 아, 클라이언먼트 신학대학원 교수, 어, 교수님이신 또데프레님이 사회를 만드셔서 어, 종합토론 집단을 시작하겠습니다. Thank you, good morning. In the paper from Ms. Jun, Jun Sok, she uses the phrase, it is a time of hope and crisis. She says, it is a time of hope and crisis. She beautifully describes the action that we need, the attitude that we need, when she writes, those who dream of ecological transformation are becoming slowly but firmly connected through issues and practices in everyday life. Listen, those who dream of ecological transformation are becoming slowly but firmly connected. Ladies and gentlemen, in this final session, we will look at that connection. Connection across organizations and leaders from East Asia and around the world. In the five speakers you have, each one is involved in global collaboration. It will be our privilege to hear them very briefly, they only have 10 minutes, to hear something about their global collaboration. Please join me in welcoming Professor Andrew Schwartz. I love the water. Uh, swimming, playing outside the water, watching the waves, the vastness of the ocean. That's better. There we go. Okay. And I know we have the, the, the Han River, right? Right next door. So imagine yourself out on the river and you're sitting in a boat. You're floating over these, these seas filled with life underneath. And then you start to notice a problem. Your boat is quickly filling with water. You know that if the boat takes on too much water, that you're going to go under. You're going to sink. So you, you think you have to address this problem. So you grab a bucket and you start throwing water overboard, over and over again, bucket after bucket, until your arms are so tired you can't even wipe the sweat from your own brow. You're not even making a dent. Despite your tireless efforts, despite all of the progress that you make, it's not enough. You're still going to sink. I think this is analogous to the global situation in which we find ourselves. The ice caps are melting, the sea levels are rising, species are going extinct, and all of this is compounded by radical uh, income inequality, systemic social injustices, the threat of war. And like bailing water from a sinking boat, it's necessary to decrease our carbon emissions, to turn to renewable energy sources, to reform education to limit the injustices of our economic systems. Yet like the boat, all of these efforts don't seem to be enough to save us. Some say it's because we're not making progress fast enough, that we need more people working to reduce waste and reduce emissions. But that's the equivalent of trying to bail water faster. I think there's another option. Let's fix the hole in the boat. We need to address the underlying causes of our world's most critical problems if we are to achieve long-term results. So how do we identify underlying causes? I think one way is by asking a simple question. Why? Why do six people possess as much wealth as half of the world's population? Why is topsoil being eroded? 
Why are global temperatures rising? Why, why, why? Deeper and deeper. By asking why, we take a step closer to understanding the source of our crisis, the sources of our crises. Through this process, two things then become apparent. First, we recognize that our world's major problems are all interconnected. You see, our global crisis is not neatly divided into separate problems, some social, some environmental. As Pope Francis tells us, we have one complex crisis, which is both social and environmental. The second thing that becomes apparent is that we recognize the true nature of our crisis is systemic. So adequately addressing the underlying cause of our complex problems requires changing the systems, the economic, political, educational, agricultural, etc., systems that are at the foundations of our society. If change isn't systemic, it's like throwing buckets of water out of the boat. At best, it just delays the consequences of our crisis. It can be helpful in the short term, but it's not enough to save us. We need to change our systems. We need to think holistically, long term. We need to fix the holes in our civilizational boat. So how do we begin to change systems? I suggest two possible avenues, vision casting and bridge building. So vision casting, we need a big picture perspective. We need a long-term comprehensive vision. One that's concerned with realistic long-term success that impacts all areas of society. A vision that's neither too short-term and specific nor too long-term and abstract to offer concrete guidance. This is the vision of ecological civilization. We also need to build bridges. You see, the complexity of the, and the scale of our global crisis requires collaboration across all sectors of society. We need to build bridges between academics and activists, between leaders in government and businesses and NGOs, between those working in economics and agriculture, education and more. We need all of this if we're going to facilitate collaboration for social change toward an equi equitable way of living in harmony with one another and the planet. Without the bridge building component, the vision of ecological civilization is stuck as an irrelevant abstraction but without the comprehensive and holistic vision, there's no foundation on which to propose systemic change. We need both. So the Institute for Ecological Civilization that I represent seeks to do this work, this bridge building and vision casting work on a global scale. We work internationally to support systemic approaches to long-term sustainable and equitable human communities by developing collaborations with people like yourselves, uh, among government, business, religious leaders, scholars, activists, policymakers. Uh, EcoCiv builds effective partnerships across social sectors through education, consultations, and policy engagement. Perfect. So what is ecological civilization? You have this institute that's working for ecological civilization, but maybe you've never heard of it before. It's a new term for you. Well, ecological civilization uh, is a vision of a world in which the systems of society, economic, political, systems of production, consumption, agriculture, and so on, are designed for the overall well-being of people and the planet. It's a vision for the common good and the flourishing of life in all of its forms. Ecological civilization is more than sustainability, but it must be sustainable. It's more than environmentalism, but it must involve living in harmony with nature. It's more than just a philosophy, but it must involve a change in worldview, a change in our thinking. The integration of theory and practice, of global, local, of environmental, social, scholarship and activism, these are among the central features of the ecological civilization movement. So where do we go from here? What's next? I'm happy to say that this international forum on ecozoic culture that we're all a part of is an important step toward international partnership capable of advancing this vision of ecological civilization. As demonstrated by the participants here and the ones on, on my panel, uh, representatives from China, Korea, Japan, we've got people from Germany, the US, there is a movement already underway. Great work is being done to transform our civilization from the bottom up and the top down. Yet like Captain Kirk from Star Trek, 
we too are set out on a journey to boldly go where no one has gone before. You see, there's never been an ecological civilization before, so our vision needs to be flexible since we're discovering for the first time what it requires. Continuing to arrange collaborative convenings and think tank events like this one will be important for creating space where we can learn from one another for a model of mutual transformation. I think one way to work together and learn together is by developing a global network for ecological civilization. We might say a postmodern network, one that's decentered, non-hierarchical, and self-organizing. Because the unprecedented global crisis requires unprecedented uh, collaboration, unprecedented global partnerships, we need to think in terms of networks in, in collaboration. So imagine a, a global network with maybe local nodes. You see, it's not a local network to the exclusion of the global or a global network to the exclusion of the local. It's a dynamic series of local networks with a global scope capable of collaborative self-organization. Thinking locally provides enough focus for concrete transformation, yet when we recognize the interconnection of our local communities, as John Cobb would tell us, communities of communities of communities and so on, the local is inseparable from the global. And I hope that each of you would consider yourselves part of this postmodern network for ecological civilization. To put my uh, money where my mouth is, so to speak, or uh, my uh, practice uh, into my ideas, I'd like to invite all of you to collaborate with us this April in Claremont, California for the 13th International Forum on Ecological Civilization and the second International Youth Forum on Ecological Civilization. Uh, the theme is uh, Ecological Civilization and Holistic Human Development. I, I don't have time to read the brief description here, but you can find more information on ecociv.org. Uh, the conference, Holistic Human Development, uh, focusing on what it means to be an eco-person, to be the kind of person that can build an ecological civilization. So, uh, moving forward together, thank you very much. Dr. Schwartz begins by thinking of bridge building and asking you to take the big picture perspective, to put all the different pieces together as we join in partnership. Sustainability, environment, theory, and practice, all together in one framework. A global network of activists combining local and global. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dr. Wang Chetra. Uh, first of all, I want to express my deep appreciation to uh, Director Kang, the people for Earth. Also, I want to thank my friend, uh, uh, Dr. Zhang and uh, Dr. Han for inviting me to here. Uh, I believe ecological civilization begins with the friendship. So those days I eat uh, Korean food, I become love Korea. Yeah. This is the, the topic for today. Yeah. <clears throat> so the, you know, I want to briefly talk about the, those the questions. Yeah. First, uh, who is IBDC? Yeah. I think the, it's a very, very small organi non-profit organization. Yeah. It's uh, established in uh, 2004. Yeah. Our leader is uh, John Cobb, David Griffin, and uh, Philip Clayton. Yeah. He's, uh, but people probably will, that's it, uh, we call it Gang of Four. And the philosophy behind uh, IPDC is uh, White has a philosophy or philosophy of organism. Yeah. But why postmodern? People probably always ask this question because you know the in the uh, right now uh, in China, I think both probably in the world there are two uh, two uh, how the tendency. One try to continue the modern. One try to back to tradition, return to tradition. But we think uh, that continue the modern be with dead end. But uh, back to return to tradition is impossible. Yeah. So that is why I think the, we should have found a new way, become creative. So we call the postmodern way or ecological way. That is uh, the the other message our institute want to deliver. Yeah. And the, what we have achieved so far, 
you know, the, I, I know the people like the number. So far, we already organized, uh, we, with our partner, org organized the 100 conference. We have uh, 36 centers in China, and a lot of uh, also the translation program, yeah, uh, also lecture program. And the, so through all those programs, you know, the, we <coughs> already produce some influence. One, the, the translation program is very productive. This is the book uh, by David Griffin, Reenchantment of Science. Yeah. I think in China, almost every scholar uh, knows this book. Yeah. This is, uh, we also have uh, tr published, translated the book, uh, The Great Work by Thomas Berry. Yeah. This is the 2004. So it's, uh, this is the, uh, the, our center, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, remember the 2011, yeah. That's David Griffin, yeah. This is the 2013, it's Guangzhou, yeah. This is when Dr. Cobb disappeared yeah, here. <laughs> <laughs> Hide here. You know, I'm not good at technology <laughs> because I'm a postmodern thinker, yeah. The, 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 among the hundred conference, one of the most influential one, the biggest one is the, our Claremont Ecological Forum. Yeah, forum, yeah. So far we already organized the 12, yeah, 12, 12 forum. So like uh, Dr. Andrew Schwartz mentioned that the next year we will have another one, yeah. There's a uh, 13, yeah, welcome to join us, yeah. And the, this is the people if you seek uh, clear. This is the seventh uh, forum. If you see clearly, you can see the uh, Dr. Wen Jun, our hero here. Yeah, is the, you know sitting uh, just the set next to Dr. Ka. Yeah, and also Zhang Xiaode, another leading finger in China eco movement. Yeah, and uh, Shai Liao, Yeah, also there. Yeah. So it's, uh, that's the uh, next year. You're welcome to join us. Yeah. So is it, um, that's it, uh, another leading finger from the government official uh, promoting eco safe in China, yeah. I think though, so that's it, um, you can see the, the influence, yeah, of work there. So the, um, also the, on this trip, after this conference, we back to uh, China. Uh, Minister Pan will meet Dr. Cobb also, yeah. So the, um, you can see that right now, ten, 20 years ago, eco uh, when we talk about the postmodern term, ecological term, people always laugh at us, yeah. Think we catch up the dunes, yeah. Which China should develop first, clean and uh, later, yeah. And then right now, people, more and more people realize that, okay, the how important, how urgent uh, promoting ecological civilization. So even the term, the term already the um, writing in the, uh, in parties, the uh, parties constitution, also in government's in the China's constitution, yeah, that's the last year. So I think that uh, uh, China's President Xi Jinping called the eco civ construction as the millennial plan. Yeah. So it's the also uh, uh, right you know before when the evaluate the government official always in term of the GDP. Right now also is changing. Yeah. So it's the that's the. People think, some people always doubt, people probably, you know, we also, the government uh, just uh, talk, talking, talking. Actually, you know, one in this trip, uh, Dr. Cobb, and uh, we visit several places, even the village, we see the, even the, in the grass level, people start to working, yeah, okay, yeah. And uh, the, so that is the, in Liandu, yeah. So the, another conference in Beijing, we call the trash conference, yeah, or tr conference on trash. Those the, we have, we got uh, totally 100, 300 people uh, from village, uh, villager, uh, village leader, uh, government official, NGO, and also business people. So um, one of the amazing part uh, the conference make, make me feel amazed is that uh, the three, uh, two days conference, uh, 300 people, no one empty bottle. So all that's even nobody used the, like, you know, the one time, you know, cup, no. So let's see the everybody bring their own their own the bottle, yeah, to drink water. Yeah. So that's really something people already start do something already, yeah. So the, the but what's the what's the obstacles in the future? We think the still there we have a long way to go. I think why is the the world will is very important. Yeah, there must be something wrong with its philosophy if an error goes wrong. 
So that's why we want to uh, call for the second enlightenment. Yeah. So there was uh, because of something wrong with the first enlightenment. The first enlightenment behind the modernization. Yeah. So that's the, the philosophy. We should have found the problem. Yeah. This is the, the first enlightenment. And the, we, uh, you know, of course, you can list a long, give a long list, but uh, here we list uh, 11 points yeah, in our book, Second Enlightenment, published uh, by Pink University Press, 2011. Yeah. So it's the, that you can see the, those are the uh, problem. Yeah. Um, so because those are the problem, um, we call for Second Enlightenment. In Chinese uh, context, I don't know whether in Korea, the Enlightenment means awakening. Wake up, yeah. People still sleeping, want to wake up people. Yeah, that's called enlightened, yeah. So it's the, but what is the second enlightenment? Yeah. So we, we list the, also list the 11 point, yeah. 11 point, yeah. So it's the, all those uh, features, characteristics release each other, release each other, yeah. <clears throat> because the because time limited, I can't uh, explain one by one, yeah. So it's the, uh, if you can't remember so many points, it doesn't remember the four points, it's enough. Yeah. So the, the second enlightenment is an ecological enlightenment. The core idea of a second enlightenment is ecological awareness. The core values of, uh, is, uh, is respect for others. The philosophy is the organic philosophy. The rule of survival is the survival of the harmonious. It's different than the, okay, yeah, the traditional one. So this is a poem that is already the uh, already uh, attract the society's attention. Attention, yeah. So the professor Tang, you know, speak highly of the second enlightenment. And yeah. So this is the. So okay. Okay, that's the my my last message. We said that right now we in China our organization promoting movement called the Count Me In. We always ask other people to start first. It's time for us to start first. So count me in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Wong, thank you for your inspiring work, which is an example to all of us. You begin with a small organization. Now you organize 100 conferences. Your idea of ecological civilization is an inspiration to Dr. Cobb and all the Claremont organizations. I think you can teach us how to expand our own work from local activism to a global scale. And we are inspired by the work of your organization and hope to do one half as well as what you have accomplished. Thank you very much. Dr. Fun, did you? So I would like to thank uh, the Ms. Call me so calm, and Dr. Yong Jin Han and the Professor Guna Jung uh, for their warm uh, invitation. So it's my uh, privilege to be here uh, to learn from those scholars uh, from U.S., Japan, Germany, especially from Korea scholar. Actually, I learn a lot. Okay, so this is my uh, uh, topic for today. Yeah, I just want to share uh, what we are thinking about uh, what we can do for creating an uh, ecological civilization. So I will focus on the educational approach. So this is uh, our logo for IPDC. Yeah, so the logo actually designed by US uh, a lady uh, who know nothing about uh, Chinese uh, character. Uh, he selected this uh, character just uh, by his feeling. So Dr. Andrew Stewart, uh, talking about uh, the uh, bridge building, IPDC is trying to build a bridge between China and the US between modern and the tradition. And the IPDC is also a fruit uh, from the Center for Process Study in Climate. 
So, and the IPDC will focus on promoting ecological civilization, especially in China, because China is so big. So if China decide to go to industrial civilization, our planet cannot afford. That will be a disaster, not only for China as well, as for the whole planet. So what's the uh, uh, ecological civilization as a whole? So I just list here, people can compare uh, between those two uh, story, old story and the new story. Old, uh, uh, the dying industrial civilization and the new, uh, ecological civilization. So that is how we have this picture for the uh, ecological transformation. So here, so I put, yeah, I will uh, focus on the three point. So because we want, this is uh, to build the ecological civilization need a paradigm change. And this change requires new type of philosophy and the philosophy of organism. I think it's such a philosophy and can lay a foundation for an ecological civilization. Here I put white house philosophy and the Chinese tradition. I, will, uh, I would see a little bit more about the Chinese tradition because at the current stage, as a scholar, major in Chinese uh, tradition. So I would like to emphasize China needs, badly needs White House philosophy. Yeah, to open its eye, to get a deep reflection, and uh, to feel its, its uh, resurgence. Without process of philosophy, Chinese tradition cannot be uh, resurgence, renew. Yeah, that's the things that I want to talk. So next, so what we can do to create an uh, ecological civilization? And uh, Jihe just uh, talk, count on me. Yeah, so we just uh, published this article on our WeChat a few months ago. Yeah, so that's it because what we can do so there are so many levels from so many perspective. So, and as a person, what you can do? So this is things we can do. And uh, from organization, what we can do? So because if we do nothing, as David Griffin say, if we do nothing, just do business as usual, so the ecological civilization will happen. So we'll bring the end to the human society. So here, uh, because the David Orr said the ecological crisis, it's in every way a crisis of education. So definitely how we expect the industrial education system to prepare our young generation for ecological civilization. That's it's impossible. So ecological civilization badly needs a new type of education. So why this is an industrial education, current educational system. So that is the uh, picture I have in my mind for this uh, box, current educational box. So, so I just uh, say, uh, point out these three, yeah. Modern, uh, the current education was designed for the city, not for the countryside, not for the rural area. So if you escaped uh, from a uh, uh, countryside and found a job in city, that uh, people will think you are successful. If you stay uh, in farm, so people will think you are a loser. And uh, so the second, it's a current educational system 
was designed for research. That is how Dr. Karp always criticized the modern research university. Yeah. And the third, modern education was designed to serve the market. So that is the result. So the problem we have for our current uh, educational system, value-free, market-oriented or education, ultra specialization, radical individualism, anti-intellectualism, worship of science and technology. True? OK. So OK. So definitely, this is the uh, picture I have for the comparison between the current one and the new one, okay? And so now we just uh, establish a very humble uh, Eco Academy. We call Cobb Eco Academy Shangshan Valley in Zhejiang province on uh, October 3rd. So, and uh, so what we are going to do, because we want to go radically for the education reform, so that is the detail yeah, we are going to do. So we will have uh, 10 to 15 students next year. So then we will prepare our local community leaders and the new farmer with the new story as David uh, Corton, Dr. David Corton mentioned. So this is a curriculum. So I don't have time to go over, uh, to uh, go all of them. And uh, because our voice, it's uh, so small. So we need to work together. So in doing so, we will have more hope for our children and the planet. That is my suggestion. We need to work to, uh, together to make uh, our voice louder. And uh, this is a global network of education, uh, ecological education will do. Hope all of you can join us to make, uh, make a better future for our young generation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Meiju, for your focus on education. We know that there will be no long-term change without the change in young people, the change in education. You gave us three pieces that will be essential to new forms of education. You draw, um, Dr. Fan, on the traditional wisdom of your culture. You're able to use contemporary thinkers to help you thinkers like Whitehead, or Thomas Berry, David Corton, John Cobb, to give guidance. And then your education seeks to transform young people for the common good. Thank you for that inspiring talk, Dr. Fonds. Our next speaker is Mr. Ken Kitsitani. Please welcome Mr. Kitsitani. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I'd like to offer my deepest gratitude to Minister Kong, Professor Jung, and uh, Dr. Han for, and also, of course, ECOSIV for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. Uh, this has been a continuation from last year where I was invited to participate at the Claremont Korea ECOSIV conference. It's so wonderful meeting uh, many of you there, and uh, so it's been delightful to once again meet you again uh, at this time. So today, I would like to speak briefly about the work that Forum 21 Institute has been doing, especially in the area of the United Nations. So before I go into that, I'd like to briefly explain the uh, concept or the how Forum 21 began. Actually, it's more than 20 years ago that uh, my sister organization got together with Dr. John Cobb and. Philip Clayton in Japan and also the United States. It was the late 1990s as we were preparing for our international conference. And since that time, uh, we've established several sister organizations throughout the world. Forum 21 was uh, established in the United States in 2012. And so we share in this vision of uh, helping to create uh, or move in the direction of realizing an ecological civilization. 
And what that means is, as we've been hearing about just since yesterday, how can we introduce this new story, a new narrative, to all humankind? If you're familiar with that movie, The Matrix, it's like taking the red pill. So many of us have taken the red pill many times, and it takes, I think, repeated, uh, uh, how should I say, uh, pills to really help us to awaken to the reality of this given situation. Dr. Uh, Phil Clayton explained yesterday in his talk that essentially the problem that we're facing today in the narrative is that we live in a values-free world. And so as uh, Dr. Major Fan just explained, the issue is that uh, in society now and for many centuries, uh, the purpose of life is to make money and the person who dies with the most amount of money wins. So that's basically the uh, idea or paradigm that we're all living according to in this world. So with the work that we do at Forum 21, we work together with uh, different uh, organizations, mainly faith-based organizations and value-based organizations inside and outside of the United Nations to research and explore the intersection and relationship between sustainable development, environmental protection, and values and ethics. The reason why is because, as we just talked about, the major issue or the foundational problem of society is that we live in a values-free world. So uh, thank God there's been many major changes in the United Nations. It's not all perfect, but we're going in a good direction. And ever since the 2012, around that time, since the Rio Plus 20 conference, the United Nations be has become much more open to values and ethics. Until then, it has been a strictly secular organization and refused to work closely with value-based organizations and especially religious organizations. But since that time, things have changed so that they are now open to collaborating with religious organizations, spiritual organizations, and value-based organizations. And they now uh, have adopted terminology such as spiritual values, yes, spiritual values, and ethics. So our work mainly has been to work with, as I said, faith-based organizations and value-based organizations outside of the UN. And we work together and collaborate with like-minded organizations and individuals such as ECOCIV, Center for Process Studies, the Thomas Berry Foundation, uh, the Teilhard de Chardin, Chardin Foundation, the Earth Charter, the UN Sustainable Development Goals, Pope Francis and his uh, dicastery for the promotion of integral human development. In other words, the, uh, the department that's been newly formed by Pope Francis to promote integral ecology. And also we do a lot of work with various indigenous peoples throughout the world. Why? Because, as Philip mentioned yesterday, what's very, very important at this time is to reconnect with the ancient wisdom traditions of all countries and all peoples throughout the world. Now, particularly with the UN, our focus has been to work with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goals are 17 goals with 169 targets that have a goal to achieve a sustainable world. In other words, it is a blueprint or a map for guiding cities and villages and countries in establishing sustainable cities and villages. And this is a, a, was a monumental task and was extraordinary because as you, as you can understand, it's difficult for even individuals in a single family to come to an agreement. The UN consists of 193 nation states. It took seven years of complicated and, and long and arduous uh, negotiations to come down, come up with these 17 goals and 169 targets. So these are a comprehensive set of 17 goals that can guide cities and countries, governments, etc., should they desire to help establish a sustainable city and sustainable community. The biggest issue here is that the SDGs, otherwise the Sustainable Development Goals, are based on the GDP economic model. So there's this tension in the UN, the two groups of people, one group that says, we can create a sustainable world with the current economic model. All we have to do is tweak it. 
And then there are a whole bunch of other people saying, no, that's impossible. These SDGs are great, but we need a completely new economic model, otherwise known as alternatives to the GDP. So we work together with both of these sectors within the United Nations, especially with the alternatives to the GDP sector. In other words, we work together with faith-based organizations and value-based organizations and to be able to distill a set of ethics and values that can be introduced to the Sustainable Development Goals so that the Sustainable Development Goals can be founded upon values. And in order to be accepted by the United Nations, these need to be beyond religion. They need to transcend religious doctrine. In other words, they need to be ethical and values-based in, uh, in essence. So this is uh, taking a lot of time and work, and so this is why we'd like to work together with as many like-minded organizations, such as all of you here. And uh, it's been a very, very interesting journey. I'd like to conclude by saying that in the UN, there are four basic sections that need to work together. One is the governmental bodies or nation states that are represented by the different missions. One, once again, 193 different missions or consulates represented at the United Nations. Then we have the UN agencies, such as UNICEF, UNDP, UNFPA, etc. The 40 to 50 UN different agencies. And then you have the business sector, which is called the Global Compact. So small, middle, large corporations that want to get accredited or affiliated with the United Nations join this group called the Global Compact. And finally, we have civil society. There are approximately 20 to 30,000 nonprofit organizations and value-based organizations, religious organizations that work with the UN. But out of those 20 to 30,000 organizations, there are about 8,000 that have been accredited with the United Nations as UN NGOs. It's not that difficult. All you have to do is apply, be a, uh, have a nonprofit status for at least three years, and then if you're financially sound and above board, then chances are you'll be uh, accredited as a UN NGO. So we work together with all of these UN NGOs in this process of how can we incorporate and introduce values and ethics into the Sustainable Development Goals. So this is gonna be, again, again a long-term process, and we like to work together with, uh, with as many like-minded uh, individuals and organizations to achieve this process. And this is one aspect, one way that we can contribute towards the ecological civilization. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kintani, for this powerful spiritual vision in your paper. You offer us a model of moving from the local to the global. You begin with the spiritual vision of Otama Okada, who gives very specific ideas for moving toward a new civilization. But in your work, you moved from that specific to the level of the United Nations that you work to support their focus on values and to help other organizations like those in this room to become United Nations NGOs. So thank you for the influence of your work and the inspiration of that move to the global level. We appreciate that very much. And our final speaker before we move to the panel discussion is Sorry. Professor, no, Ms. Jung-Sok-Yon, and I hope that you will join us. Please welcome her to the podium. Yeah. 안녕하십니까? 저는 녹색연합이라고 하는 환경단체의 공동 대표면서 지구와 사람들의 회원이기도 합니다. 오늘 저는 어, 현장의 얘기들 그리고 바로 제가 일주일 전에 다녀온 북한 얘기, 방북한 얘기를 통해서. 우리가 고민할 것이 무엇인지 또 앞으로 더 우리가 어떤 어, 어, 실천을 더할수 있을지에 대해서 얘기 말씀드리겠습니다. 사실 15분 정도라고 생각해서 좀 길게 원고를 썼지만 제가 중간 중간에 잘라가면서 일, 읽어보겠습니다. 어, 생태 문명은 다른 길로 들어가는 것이라 생각합니다. 
그 길은 쉽지도 않고 가깝지도 않을 것이며 게다가 지금 모두가 동의하는 것도 아닙니다. 그럼에도 생태적 전환의 길은 더는 미룰 수 없는 불가, 불가피한 선택이자 최선의 결단이며 또한 인간의 운명이라고 생각합니다. 레이첼 카슨이 1962년에 쓴 침묵의 봄 1962년이니까 벌써 50년이 넘은 얘기네요. 그 침묵의 봄의 마지막 장에 묻힌 제목은 가지 않은 길입니다. 그녀는 아직 가지 않은 길은 마지막이자 가지 않은 다른 길은 마지막이자 우리에게 남은 유리한, 유리한, 유일한 기회이며 우리는 이 세상이 인간만의 것이 아니라 모든 생명체와 공유하는 것이, 것이라는 생각에서 다시 출발해야 한다고 얘기하고 있습니다. 생태 문명을 향한 전환은 어떻게 어디서 시작될 수 있을까요? 인간과 지구의 모든 생명체가 서로를, 서로에게 생명을 주는 존재로 관계를 맺는 새로운 시대를 향한 우리의 꿈은 어떻게 현실이 될수 있을까 생각을 합니다. 생태 전환의 길은 희망과 설레임을 주지만 한편 우리는 일상과 운동의 현장에서 말은 일하는 많은 사람들은 불안과 분노를 견디고 또한 저항을 하고 있습니다. 생태 문명을 꿈꾸는 사람들에게 현실을 모른다고 비난을 받기도 합니다. 소수의 이상주의자들, 낭만적인 헛소리를 하는 몽상가들이 한 비난을 저희는 자주 듣고 있습니다. 경제 성장과 개발의 주류 패러다임이 여전히 강고하고 생태적 전환을 향한 노력들은 빈번히 이들을, 이들의 외면과 방해에 좌절하고 있는 것이 현실입니다. 부정할 수 없는 현실입니다. 그럼에도 불구하고 생태 전환을 꿈꾸는 사람들은 삶의 현장에서 그리고 구체적으로 다양한 이슈와 실천을 통해서 천천히 그러나 단단히 연결되고 있음을 저는 매일같이 보고 있습니다. 한반도와 동아시아의 시민사회 간의 교류연대는 사실 이미 시작되고 있습니다. 특히 2000년 이후로 아주 활발하게 시작되고 있습니다. 저는 몇 가지 사례를 말씀드리고 싶습니다. 지난 9월에 서울에서 동아시아 미군기지 해결을 위한 한일 간의 심포지움이 있었습니다. 11년째 계속해온 한일 간의 연대입니다. 이 회의에서 수십 년간 기지 건설을 위해 땅을 매립하고 주변 생태계를 회복 불가능하게 현배시킨 상황과 저항 사례들이 열심히 공유되고 있었습니다. 그리고 평화와 생태가 하나의 이슈라는 데에 깊은 공감을 하며 한국과 일본에 존재하는 200여 개의 기지는 성공적인 경제 성장과 산업 문명의 아이콘인 한일 양국의 짙은 그림, 그림자를 직면하게도 만들었습니다. 회의를 마치며 모든 참가자들은 우리의 평화는 우리만의 평화가 아니다. 평화의 가장자리에서 평화를 넓혀간다고 라 하는 아주 인상 깊은 연대 선언문을 만들었습니다. 그리고 일본의 참가자들은 한국의 곳곳의 환경과 평화의 현장을 방문하는 그런 연대의 시간을 갖게 되었습니다. 또 하나 2015년대에는 한국, 중국, 일본 시민사회가 시민사회 100여 개 단체들이 기후변화 대책 강화와 지속가능한 동아시아 협력을 위한 한중일 시민사회 공동성명을 발표했습니다. 21차 유엔 기후변화협약 당사국 총회를 앞두고 발표된 이 성명서에서는 세계의 온실가스 배출량의 3분의 1을 차지하는 한중일 3개국이 큰 책임을 느껴야 하며 화석 연료를 탈피한 에너지 시스템으로의 전환을 위해서 시민들이 깊이 연대해야 한다는 것에 공감 어, 성명을 냈습니다. 사실 일, 2011년도 일본 후쿠시마 핵폭발 사고, 사고로 동아시아 시민사회에 갖고 있는 위기감은 굉장히 높고 또한 이를 통한 연대와 성찰의 깊이도 점점 깊어지고 있습니다. 사실 우리는 기후변화와 미세먼지 등으로 삶의 초불확실성의 상태로 놓여있다는 위기감을 모두 느끼고 있습니다. 이미 2004년도에 한중일 회의에서는 생태공동체 네트워크를 만들자는 제안도 있었습니다. 시민들의 이런 연대를 통해 핵발전소, 기후변화와 미세먼지, 사막화, 개발 만능 등의 위험들이 각각의 독립적인 문제가 아님을 깨닫고 있습니다. 일상과 미래를 위협하는 이 문제들이 일국 안에서 또한 특정 집단만이 해결할 수 있거나 또한 빠르게 해결할 수 있다고 생각하는 사람은 아무도 없을 것입니다. 그러나 아직은 거대한 흐름은 아니지만 마을과 광장에서 지역과 중앙에서 이루어지는 창의적이고 다양한 신천들을 저는 매일같이 보고 있습니다. 이런 작고 큰 실천들이 연결될 때 다른 길을 만들어갈 수 있는 힘이 커진다는 것은 시민들이 실천 속에서 알고 있습니다. 한반도의 평화의 봄이 시작되고 있습니다. 그러나 저는 이 전환의 시대의 위기와 희망과 위기 양측면을 모두 통찰하며 진정한 새로운 전환점을 만들어야 한다고 깊이 생각하고 있습니다. 4.27 남북정상회담 이후 70년간의 분단과, 분단과 냉전 체제 속에서 미움과 대립에 가혹했던 시대를 넘을 수 있다는 기적같은 희망이 희망을 우리는 봅니다. <웃음> 지금 한국 시민사회는 빠르게 평화체제의 움직임에 
스스로 나서서 응답하고 있습니다. 이미 9월 달부터 평화와 통일을 위한 사회적 대화의 원대, 원, 원탁 테이프이 부산, 서울, 광주에서 열리고 있습니다. 그리고 연내에 평화 비전, 어, 평화 통일 비전 사회적 대화를 위한 전국 시민회가 창립될 것으로 계획되고 있습니다. 그렇지만 벌써 파주와 인근 지역의 땅값이 오르고 있습니다. DMZ를 생태 관광지로 개발해 돈을 벌자는 주장도 목소리가 커지고 있습니다. 북한의 석탄이 풍부하니 석탄 발전소를 건설하자는 의견도 만만치 않게 올라오고 있습니다. 저는 지난주 며칠간 평양을 방문했습니다. 2007년 남북, 남북 정상들이 맺은 14선언 발표가 10년 만에 민족통일 행사로 이루어졌기 때문입니다. 그, 중, 그 행사의 슬로건은 한반, 한반도의 평화와 번영이었습니다. 저는 행사 그 방문 기간 내내 이 번영은 무엇을 말하는 것인가 남한의 방식을, 방식은 한반도 번영의 모델로 될수 있을 것인가 남북 협력의 과정에서 생태적 관점과 방식은 어떻게 저, 접목되고 어떻게 개입될까 할까라는 생각에 떠나지 않았습니다. 두 체제의 기존의 방식을 넘어서 새로운 번영의 길은 무엇인가 라고 하는 질문을 깊이 해야 될 때라고 생각을 하고 있습니다. 간단히 사진을 좀 보여줄 수 있을까요? 예, 사진을 몇장 보겠습니다. 이건 놀라운 사진입니다. 저희가 한 번도 하지 않는 법적으로는 남한, 남한은 북한의 적국입니다. 그런데 적국의 공군기를 타고 민간인들이 어, 평양공항에 착륙한 최초의 어, 사건이었습니다. 랜딩할 때 어, 같이 간 방문객들은 모두가 박수를 치고 환호를 질렀습니다. 이게 뭐요? 여러분 보다시피 이것이 저희가 한큰 매치게임 수만 명이 하는 매치게임을 보았습니다. 우리 당과 국가 군대의 최고령 김정은 동지께 최대 영광을 드립니다. 사회주의 공업국가 과학기술이 과학기술의 용마를 타고 용마는 용감한 말이란 뜻이죠. 그리고 곳곳에 미래를 사랑하자는 말도 있었습니다. 굉장히 파스텔 톤의 톤으로 도시가 바뀌었지만 저는 이한 장의 사진을 보았습니다. 저 굴뚝이 24시간 굴뚝에서 연기가 나온 걸 보았습니다. 그리고 또한 굴뚝 옆에 건물에는 태양광 패널도 있고 이러한 건물도 볼수 있었습니다. 저희는 무엇을 선택해야 될까요? 그리고 어떻게 번영의 길을 남북 양국의 현체제를 넘어선 번영의 길을 시작할 수 있을까? 저는 호텔방에서 아까 이그 그림을 사진을 보면서 많은 생각을 하게 되었습니다. 평화체제의 희망이 시작된 것은 분명하지만 남한이 걸어왔던 압축적 산업화 도시와 자연 해설을 외면하는 개발이 복제된다면 그것은 분명 위기일 것입니다. 이는 북한 대, 북한에 국한된 것이 아니기 때문입니다. 평화는 전쟁 위협이 없는 상태일 뿐만 아니라 인간과 자연의 생태적 공정이 가능한 사회를 추구하는 가운데 공부해진다고 생각하기 때문입니다. 최근 한반도의 비핵화, 동시에 한반도의 녹색화를 평화체제의 시작부터 추 숙고해야 된다 한다는 생각들이 얘기들이 지금 등장하고 있습니다. 굉장히 저는 이 비핵화와 한반도의 녹색화 이 얘기는 깊이 천착할 수 있는 해야 될 얘기라 생각합니다. 동아시아 생태 시민 사회는 다양한 주체들의 유연한 연대가 더 확장됨으로써 어, 발, 발전될 것입니다. 그 연대의 주체는 생태적 전환을 꾸는 모든 사람들 모든 계층과 지역 세대일 것입니다. 그리고 다양한 집단과 공동체들 이론과 실천 그룹들이 보다 자주 다양한 형식으로 패치워크를 마련해야 됩니다. 국가와 민족의 경계를 넘어서 다양한, 그룹, 다양한 그룹들이 따로 또 함께 연대를 해 하면서 단단한 주류 패러다임의 균열을 내면서 나가야 한다고 생각합니다. 특히 강조할 것은 동아시아 생태적 시민사회의 젊은 세대, 세대 간의 연결입니다. 어, 아직 소두, 소수지만 젊은 세대들 가운데 주류의 트랙에서 나와 자신의 삶의 방식을 만들어가는 움직임이 늘고, 늘고 있습니다. 귀촌을 하기도 하고 건박한 삶 속에서 노동과 유의를 자기네 방식으로 디자인한 그룹들이 적어도 한국에서는 많이 등장하고 있습니다. 그들은 그들의 부모 세대가 내재한 국가주의, 경제성장주의와 과학기술에 대한 맹신 등의 의문을 제기하며 다른 방식의 삶의 매력을 받습니다. 이들이 생태적 저, 이들의 흐름이 생태적 문명, 생태전환의 흐름과 접속되어 새로운 주체로서 동아시아 젊은 세대들과 함께한다면 생태적 전환의 길은 매우 풍부해질 것이라고 생각합니다. 앞에 말씀드렸던 것처럼 생태적 전환과 연대를 만들어 온 크고 작은, 작은 움직임들은 이미 있어 왔고 점점 다양해지고 풍성해지고 있습니다. 굳이 이러한 움직임을 생태 문명이라고 명명하거나 생태적 전환으로 개념, 전환의 개념으로 설명하고 있지 않지만 이미 존재하는 그러한 실천과 연재들은 문명 전환을 꿈꾸는 다양한 주체들의 노, 노력과 열정의 표현이라고 할수 있습니다. 앞으로 생태적 전환을 위해 연대해온 동아시아의 다양한 주체들의 실천과 
주, 주체들과, 주체와 실천들이 보다 긴밀하게 그리고 따로 또 같이 묶이고 접속되고 연결될 수 있기를 바랍니다. 그리고 앞으로 생, 오늘과 같은 생태문명 회의가 중국과, 일, 중국과 일본 등으로 이어지길 바라며 또 각국에서 어, 각국의 특성을 기반으로 따로 그렇지만 또 함께 동아시아를 돌면서 만나게 되기를 그리고 우리가 접속돼서 점점 어, 풍부한 생태문명의 길을 만들어 나가기를 어, 기대하며 이 토론을 맺습니다. Thank you, Ms. Lin. We'd like to express our deep respect for your work. As director of Green Korea, you offer a powerful example of beginning in Korea and developing international collaborations. You will participate in the Korea-Japan symposium and help the declaration standing on the edge, we are spreading the peace. You play a leadership role in Korea, China, Japan, civil society and help to write the joint statement. And now you tell us of the role of the spring of peace on the Korean Peninsula. Ms. Yoon, these are examples of collaboration that we can use at our own organizations. Please thank, you. One, thank the speakers one more time for their very much. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to allow you to watch the speakers in actual dialogue with each other. So they have promised not to give long answers, but to explore questions and to talk with each other. The reason we do this is we want to show what friendship can be among leaders from different cultures and languages. Friendship starts, you see somebody, you're attracted, you begin to talk, but the highest level of friendship is when you work together. And I believe that these five inspiring leaders can show us friendship that works together. Okay, um, Andrew and Ken, can you each tell us in one sentence, where do we start? If you say a first step would be this, what would be a first step for starting as we build this work together. Uh, I would start with a declaration, perhaps something like a project declaration. We'll hear more about that on the terrace. Yeah. I think we're already taking the first step with this conference. Uh, starting uh, to continue with this is to, I think, find uh, individuals or organizations that we really strongly resonate with and to continue the dialogue with such organizations and then start planning on collaboration. Um, Dr. Wang and Dr. Khan, why does this language of moving from one old civilization to a new one, first to second in language, why does that matter? It seems very abstract to build, for example, uh, an eco school like Dr. Fun. Why does it matter to use this big idea in your opinion? It's better for me. So and uh, uh, in this uh, um, uh, January in Claremont, we have a conference on um, the farmer and the philosopher. So that uh, through that conference, I just learned that. So there is no time for us, right? The ecological uh, <coughs> yeah, it's coming. So we need to uh, just do it. Yeah, uh, use uh, whatever we, uh, whatever uh, the energy and the support we have. Just do it. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that you know the you never can uh, wake up a person who pretend to sleep. So I think we better you know the. Uh, in all the, every reform or every movement always start from small group. So I think that we should start with ourselves. Did the others have any response? 
why does it matter to have a large idea, for example, ecological civilization, or the spiritual values of the teacher? Why are these big ideas important for activists, people like these people who want to make a difference?
제가 이번에 환경운동가 논란 사람이었는데 제가 환경과 세태라는 말을 모를 때 그게 무엇이냐고 물어, 물어봤습니다. 그리고 한국 사람을 생각하는 어느 사람은 지금 얼마나 급한데 지금 환경 생태 얘기를 하냐고 오히려 저에게 질문을 하기도 했습니다. 어쨌든 다시 돌아가면 저는 우리 만나야 됩니다. 더 자주 만나야 되고 우리가 현실에서 실험해온 그 많은 사례들 성공한 기쁨들 잘못 가서 또 실패한 것들조차도 만나면서 만나서 나누는 것 그것이 시작이라고 생각을 하고 일국적인 것, 한반도적인 것을 또 넘어서 동아시아 저는 어저께 원 교수님이 어, 한반도와 어, 중국과 몽고와 러시아 멘트를 말씀하셨을 때 굉장히 이렇게 눈이 깊어 트이는 것이 있, 있, 있었습니다. 이제 저희의 한 나라의 움직임, 한반도의 움직임이 얼마나 연결되어 있는가를 저희가 생태적인 사고로도 더욱더 깊이 느낄 수 있습니다. 저는 만나야 됩니다. 그럼 얘기를 시작해 봅니다. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one last question for the panel, and then I would invite you to ask your question. But I'm, unfortunately, the time is so short, you must ask a question in one minute. That's very different, difficult in Korean and German, but you can do it. My last question is, what is the role of the transformation of the person? I want to ask Dr. Fan maybe to start and others to respond. The transformation of the individual, maybe through education or through action, why is that so important to you? Thank you for your question. Yeah, that is a very important for every individual to take the action. Yeah, I believe that uh, as a process a thinker, so we uh, do something. Yeah, then there may be no, uh, no result coming out, but uh, you keep doing that, keep doing that, and uh, you will get more and more response from other people. Then, so you will have a, a follower, like uh, Professor Wen Jiejun. So he, de, uh, he does the royal uh, construction, uh, uh, for more than 30 years. So, and uh, he did a lot of training program, yeah, 30 years ago. So this is today, no matter where we go, we go to the garbage conference, we go to our school, farming school, we always can meet his student. So that is how we plant a seed that looking for the blooming uh, in the near future. Thank you. Uh, as in a moment, as we close, I will ask each of you to say one sentence on the question, what is the idea that most inspires your action? The one idea that most inspires your leadership. But first, uh, any comments from any people present? Here's a person. So my question is the end, and then the time to our time. The um, first question I have is, how do you define civil uh, in light of the fact that civilization has a very negative context historically. Uh, one is the use of legitimize and justify imperialism and colonialism, especially within the East Asian context. And most recently in the 1990s, it was used, particularly by Sam and Huntington, to talk about conflict. So how do you escape that discourse? How do you change it? In addition to that, within that, um, I understand you want to work within uh, groups and to have some type of um, collaboration. But ultimately, you have to set up norms. You have to set up uh, ethics guide that can be applied generally. Who decides that? Uh, so that's your question. Really quickly, uh, that, um, I'm very interested in uh, the power relationships within China. So in, your, in any type of collaboration with the government, I'm wondering how do you negotiate the government's interests with your interests your association, in light of the fact that in the 20th century, historically, for example, James Dodger showed that it seemed like the state that the modern state has insidiously gone into the rural areas and has promoted a modernization project that has actually weakened uh, rural life. So I'm very curious, how do you negotiate China, which of course has a very strong mechanism of power in the countryside? 
So to answer your first question, civilization, uh, you know, it, it's complicated. There's lots of different definitions. And I, I think uh, from modifying nature to forms of human communities and uh, agricultural societies. Uh, and it's interesting, John Cobb has written about how, you know, the idea of ethological civilization may be considered an oxymoron in terms because uh, civilization is historically not ecological. Uh, it's a destruction of nature rather than working with nature. So it is a redefining, a reclaiming of the idea of civilization. As Dr. Horton has talked about, maybe for the actually truly being civilized for the first time um, in history. And regarding the norms and who defines it, I think uh, it can't come hierarchically, it can't be top down. And that's why I was calling for a, a postmodern, decenter, non hierarchical, self organizing kind of network. I think it has to be, uh, I don't think there has to be one ecological civilization that then is sort of imposed and, and works for all people. It has to be contextual and arise in different contexts. Um, I hope that helps. Dr. Wang or Dr. Fung? I think that uh, while you're working with China, the two words are very important. One is uh, humble, another is uh, constructive. One of one of person always criticizes uh, your backyard, how dirt, how big a mess. So also let let him go, right? But uh, when it's okay, let's help you do something. Also, never it's okay. I have to choose in my pocket. I give you, right? You just you just, you just use this idea. Always choose in my pocket. The like a democracy, the freedom, something like that. That's why Chinese government they really for that to listen to those those guy. They think okay, go away. Because you don't really know China. But when you really care the people, you will be in the reality you found the, you, you see, I think we are on the same board, right? The government also facing the environmental crisis, social crisis, physical crisis, we come to help. I think nobody re re refused to help. We have time for, you spoke last time. So is there anyone else who uh, would like to ask a last question from the audience? Going once, going twice, Professor Kim. <laughs> uh, uh, Albert Chu 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 소위 그 와이트헤드하고 토마스 베리의 교대 담론을 전제하고 시작하는데 과연 와이트헤드하고 그걸 발전시키는 크레먼스 부글의 프로세스 아, 철학이 또한 토마스 베리의 철학이 한반도의 뜰 중심을 한 동아시아의 교대 담론으로 받아들여 줄수 있는 것인지도 구체적으로 검토를 해 봐야 되고 특별히 제가 중국에 오신 그 프렌드에게 묻고 싶은 거는 포스트 모더니즘이라는 얘기를 하는데 과연 중국적인 그러한 스토리, 어, 그 역사적인 상황 속에서 모더니즘이 있었던지 그 모더니즘과 포스트 모더니즘이 디퍼런 그 내러티브하고 컨텍스트를 가지고 있는 상황에서 와이트헤드나 토마스 베리가 가졌던 아주 컴플리케이트한 모던 히스토리 속에서의 그러한 사유가 적절한지에 I'm sorry we don't, uh, I'm told we have to end, so I hope those were good points, challenges from Professor Kim, and I hope we can continue this discussion. So you have just one sentence. What is the inspire, the idea that inspires you the most in the work that you do? That for the first time in history, we can choose to create an ecological civilization. That gives me hope. Uh, there's a very famous Chinese author named Lu Xun used to say, there's no rule. When all people walk to the same direction, there will be a rule. That's really to hurt me. <laughs> so for me, it's the survival with harm. For me, I can say that uh, all Western traditions, including the indigenous traditions, say that now is the time for us to really create a peaceful, just, and sustainable world.
이지면 우리는 총을 들고 전쟁을 하게 된다. Now, five panelists have done a great job of giving concrete ideas for collaboration within their culture and for friendships across cultures. That has been the goal of the entire conference. Uh, we are grateful to Mr. Khan for this great idea for a conference, and I believe that the speakers during the whole time and now have attempted to meet that goal and have done a fantastic job. Please join me in thanking the five panelists.